We'll get started again here tonight on our Book of Acts study. Um, Father, we thank you today, God, for all that you're doing. We thank you, God, for your promises that you keep. And God, your protection over us. Your ministering hands of healing that you have for us. And God, I pray tonight that, Lord, you would open up our hearts to receive what you have for us out of the word. Open up our ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. And God, uh, that we are active participants tonight, God, in, in this study of your word to learn more about you and your word. And Father, we give you all praise and all glory tonight in Jesus' name. Well, tonight, uh, we're, we're back at about 169, and there are, there are three things uh, that Paul testifies of himself uh, that he used to do to Christians. And we know that we're starting off where Paul, Paul's still in jail. This, it, it, you know, it's kind of just a quick refresher. Anybody want to tell me why is Paul in jail? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Trumped up charges. People didn't like what he was saying. Okay. Anybody else? He said Jesus was alive. He said, like that okay. He said Jesus was alive. Well, here's the real answer of why Paul was in jail. Because God wanted him to be there. That's the real answer. Because if we go back, we know, if we go back into the book of Acts, we know uh, that Peter was in jail and God opened the doors for him. They opened the cell up. He caused the chains to break off and, and escorted Peter with an angel, escorted him right out of prison. So we know, we know that God has the ability. If God did not want Paul in prison or in jail, God could have easily taken him out, but God had a plan and a purpose for him. And it really hit me today as I was looking at this and thinking about that. All the times that we go through things thinking, man, uh, why? I know we probably should never ask this question, but why am I going through this? Well, maybe it's because God has a plan and a purpose for us to be there at this time and at this place. Uh, maybe we need to learn something. Maybe we need to be a witness. Here's Paul. He's got an opportunity. He had a chance before Felix. He had a chance before the captain of the guard uh, to give his testimony and to witness and to tell about Jesus. Now he's had an opportunity. He's standing before Herod Agrippa II, and he's standing before Festus, who's now in charge of Caesarea. So he again is getting the opportunity to give his testimony. And out of his testimony in 169, he says, uh, the, what are these three things that Paul testifies of himself that he used to do to Christians in verse 11? Punish them often in the synagogue. Yes, punish them often. Compel them to blaspheme. Compelled them to blaspheme. And then when he really got mad, he persecuted them. And then, yes, he persecuted them. So let's talk about that. We look at this, look at this verse. It says, Acts 26, uh, 10 and 11, which thing I also did in Jerusalem and many of the saints did, I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest when they were put in, uh, when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. I, in other words, I testified against them so that they would be put to death. And I punished them often in every synagogue, and I compelled them to blaspheme and to be exceedingly mad against them. I persecuted them even unto strange cities. So. 
He punishes them often. This has become Paul's, uh, when he was still Saul, this was, this was, his, this was his game. I mean, uh, who goes on vacation? Paul's, or Paul, Saul's getting ready to go on vacation, and he says, you know, I think I'm going to take a trip. You got anybody out there I could go hunt down while I'm on vacation? Uh, I could round up. I mean, that's the kind of guy Paul was, and that's what he was into. He was going to make sure because why? Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and he was of the strictest belief of the law, and he was going to enforce the law to the uttermost. And even when you get to uh, the second part of this, in B, it says he compelled them to blaspheme. And stop and think about what, he, what that word is actually telling us. It's telling us that Paul, Paul was trying to force Christians to deny Christ. Does that sound familiar with what we hear today? I mean, we hear that today out of uh, all, over the, all over the world where Christians are being persecuted, uh, especially by uh, certain sects of other religions. One of the things that they do is that, you know, they'll put a gun to their head, they'll put them in boxes, uh, threaten to throw them in the sea, uh, threaten to chop their head off. And what's their option out of that? Their option out of this is, will you deny Christ? Will you say he's not the Messiah, that he is not the son of the living God. And it really is interesting is that Paul wasn't able to compel any of these people to do that. They had a fervency for God that they were not willing to deny Christ. And you see that today with so many of the Christians that are being persecuted in other lands, uh, you know, the, yeah, China, uh, especially in, in the Middle East, that's where it's really uh, strict. And, you know, they're, they're there. And they're, you know, you're going to lose your head. You know, they've got the sharp sword out. And all you had to do was deny. And then you could, you know, you could go back and repent. But those people, no, no. They know if they deny Christ, it's over. They know there's no going back. And that's the love and the relationship that they have with Christ to know that I'm not going to deny it. I don't care if my head's on the line or not. If I die, I die. I die as a martyr for the kingdom of God. I die because I gave my life for him and for the cause. And I, I kind of wonder sometimes, you know, we're challenged at times uh, to read. We're challenged at times just to pray. We're challenged at times just to come to church. I mean, I, I was watching today a, a, a couple of different ministers that I'm familiar with, and they're still talking about the number of churches. Um, in fact, it was Perry Stone, and he was talking about on the number of churches in the mountainous areas of West Virginia, Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, a lot of that uh, Appalachian type area where the churches are, you know, uh, more rural, they're, they're 50 and under, a lot of the pastorates are older, they don't have the technology, uh, the finances uh, have dried up because people haven't returned, they... they they aren't able to open or people have not returned out of fear. And, and now these churches are closing and they're losing the opportunity and they're losing the place to have the ability to go and worship. And, and even though, um, you know, we, we offered here, we, we offered drive-in, uh, which was great. It was better than, uh, it's, it was better than video. Uh, <laughs> At least you felt like you had some connection. But it is nothing like going inside of the actual sanctuary and fulfilling what God has called us to do. Because he says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves. And even more so as you see the days approaching. Yes?
And then they stop going to get a habit of not going to church. It's, you're absolutely right, Sister Roxy. Yeah. The people, what, what will happen, and this is the absolute truth, is what people will do is they get out of the habit of going to church, they fill that time slot with something else. And it's very easy to do. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, I really, I really like to exercise. I know I probably don't look like it, but I do like to exercise. I, I like to get on my bike. I like to get on the treadmill. I, I like to go downtown and walk a couple of miles and come back home. But if I run out of time or something else gets in that time frame and I go, well, I can't do that. I, I, I have to make a choice. Then I, I'm very easily persuaded to make the easier choice. And I'm not saying that's blasphemy. I'm just saying these people didn't give up. They weren't going to give in even if it cost them their life. And I think, I feel like a lot of the church, even though we are going through a time uh, that is hasn't been experienced by any of us. It's uh, been a hundred plus years ago uh, since anything close to this was ever experienced. Uh, very few people alive or even remember probably what what that was like. That we're experiencing something that that is very different, and it's very easy. To get out of the habit, it's very easy to fill that time slot with something else. It's the same thing with it's really it really is the same thing with prayer life. You know, if you have a if you have a time, a set time that you, you try to get to every day that you pray, you know that's your time. That's your given time. But if you say, Well, I, I'm gonna do this, then the next day that feels very odd to be in a different place. So, you know, it's, you know, you, you feel like, well, I didn't do it yesterday. And I, you know, you start to, you start to fill that time slot with something else and it's very dangerous. Um, you know, I, I hate to be so rigid and, and organized that I stay on such a closed schedule, but I feel like God ordains a lot of that so that we're disciplined more than organized and I like to say we need to be more disciplined mm -hmm. in what we're doing yes yeah Yes. You yeah, and and that's a very good point. You know, if you you have to make time for your spouse, you have to make time for God. Sometimes it, it doesn't happen organically. I mean, it just doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. But what I do know is that as you discipline yourself, you create a habit. And, and good habits uh, are, are good to follow. Just like bad habits are bad habits to follow. If you get into them, you stay, you stay in that habit much easier than when you get out of that habit. So, Paul says... Yeah. Absolutely. They are interconnected and cannot, you know, you cannot break that. So if you're a disciple, you will have discipline. And if you're a disciple, you will be in the discipline of being a disciple to whatever you're a disciple to. Absolutely. And yes, Brother Ernie, I am saying Paul was put into prison for trumped up charges. Or 
fake chargers, maybe that's a better word. I don't know if you can use the other word. Um, so we know the, 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 the C part of this is that um, Paul tells us that he, he persecuted Christians even into strange cities. And in other words, he wasn't satisfied that uh, Jerusalem had enough uh, enough Christians to go after. He, he wanted to go into other cities and pursue them as well and round them up, you know. Uh, he, he, made it, he made it a full-time deal because he was very adamant about what he believed. And he was radical. If only Christians were as radical about getting people saved as Paul was about rounding them up, we wouldn't have room. So it says the saints uh, in 2610, it says the saints, the professors of the religion of the Holy Jesus, who were called to be saints. You find that over in Romans 1, 7. Have him... For the great example, holiness, who fulfilled all righteousness, and from him they have the spirit of holiness being sanctified in him. 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, uh, 1, chapter 1, verse 2. And whosoever hath not his spirit, he is none of his. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. And it says in the notes here, it says, I gave my voice against them, Paul says. Uh, Paul was not was not on the council, nor at any time did we ever read that Paul was on the Sanhedrin, but he gave his voice against them. What's that mean? It means that he had to be one of the witnesses, right? Because it took a witness of at least two to three to confirm an accusation against someone. So he became that, that witness. Uh, nor that we read in any of the office or place to judge any person besides the Jews and are thought to have had no power of life and death except that of, of Stephen, which was slain rather uh, really with a, just a riot. <laughs> There's no other way to really put it uh, than illegally going through the process. But Paul, it says, uh, may be said to have done this by carrying the suffrages or the sentence to the Roman uh, person in charge to make sure that these people were executed. So Paul confesses that he, he compelled them to blaspheme uh, either by the torments that he made to them to be put unto them or by his own example. Uh, for he confessed, Paul, Paul, remember now, Paul confesses here uh, that he had been a blasphemer himself. When we look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13. And the blasphemy uh, was either denying of Christ to be the Messiah or cursing uh, Christ and acknowledging that he was uh, justly condemned. And he says, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. I drove them out of Jerusalem and Judea, and according to what uh, Paul then believed, he drave them or drove them from the worship of the true God and said, in effect, as David's adversaries, uh, when they expelled him from Jerusalem, go and serve other gods. That's what Paul basically had done unto them. So in spite of all this hateful things that Paul had done, out of, out of all of that, I, I want you to, here's Paul. Paul admits he, he's persecuted. He's been a witness against Christians. Uh, and, and quite honestly, folks, we don't know for certain, but it's quite possible as a Pharisee because of the time of Passover that it was, it's very possible that Paul was in Jerusalem at the time of Christ's crucifixion and witnessed Christ's crucifixion.
It's very, very likely. So we know, here's Paul. He's, he's been a part of that. He's been a witness. He's been a pursuer of, of persecution against Christians. He's caused them or tried to get them to blaspheme. And here we are on the road to Damascus. And in spite of all of those things, what happens? God comes down. Jesus comes down and has a meeting, a face-to-face -face meeting with Saul. And he chooses him. Now, if that, doesn't, if that doesn't tell you something that no one, no one is exempt from being called to the ministry or the service of God. There is no sin, there is nothing in your past that you have done is so bad and is so wrong that God cannot use you. Here's a man who's responsible for murder. He stood there while Stephen was stoned. And he held their coats. He basically was cheering them on, throw another rock at, at, at this man while he gets killed. So here, here is, here's a man with blood on his hands, literally blood on his hands for the things that he's done. But God says, Saul, I still have a plan for you. There's no sin too great that I can't forgive. There's no sin in your past, there's nothing that you could have done that I can't forgive and that I can't use you. And I'm telling you tonight, with all that is inside of me, there is nothing that you have done that God says is so great that I can't forgive. There's nothing that you have done that God says I cannot use you. You are still qualified if I call you. And if I call you, I will most certainly equip you because my grace is sufficient. My mercy is more than enough. You see, God didn't care what Paul's past was. God had a plan and a purpose and a calling for Paul. We look at uh, our question number 170 and we look at verse 16 and it says, The Lord said to Paul that he appeared to him to make him a what? minister and a witness now most of us would look at that and go the guy's a murderer <laughs> he's done nothing good for our cause he's done nothing good for the kingdom and we would look and go man he's not why would, why would God call him and Guess what? I ask myself almost on a daily basis, God, why would you call me? Why? You, you've seen my past, God. Why would you call me? And yet, he saw something in Saul that he could use, and he sees something inside of you that he can use. And he says, I make him a minister and a witness. We read verse 16 and it says uh, in 15 and he says, and I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Well, that's a good way to start. You know, call, he calls Saul out right off the bat. Hey, I'm Jesus, the one you've been persecuting. In other words, all the people that you've been after, you've really been after me. And he says, but arise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. When we look at it in the NLT, that word minister really comes out as servant and witness. And when we look at that, we really begin to understand that what Jesus was calling Saul to be was to become a slave for Christ, a servant for him, and to give up his own life, his own freedom, and say, I belong to you. 
You paid the price and you bought me with your blood and I belong to you. But it says rise. Uh, the particulars mentioned here and in the two following verses are not given in Acts chapter 9 uh, verses 1 through 9 nor in Acts chapter 22 verses 6 through 11 where he gives an account of his conversation. He has detailed the different circumstances of, of that important event as he saw it necessary and perhaps there were several other uh, others which then took place that he had no opportunity of mentioning because uh, there was nothing in succeeding occurrences which rendered it necessary for him to produce that information. It says to make the a minister an under rower that is one who was under the guidance and authority of another an assistant or a servant so Paul was to act solely under the authority of Jesus Christ and tug hard at the oar in order to bring the vessel through the tempestuous ocean to a safe harbor and see the concluding observations. Uh, so Paul's given it, think about this, Paul's given a different, a slightly different account now of his encounter on the Damascus Road with Jesus. Why do you think that is? He's got a different crowd in front of him. He's got King Agrippa. He's got Festus and he's got all these, you remember? We've got these, these captains of over about 3,000 soldiers that are there. He's got, a, he's got all this pomp and circumstances taking place. He's given this detailed account of his encounter with Jesus and what he went through because I am sure that there were people that were sitting in that crowd hearing his story that had blood on their hands as well and were thinking, man, I've, I've murdered people. I've killed people done things that were wrong and he's given his story so that he can he can let them know man I was the worst of the worst but God still loved me enough to save me and to choose me and if he could choose me he could definitely choose you and so to whom did the Lord specifically send Paul then in 171 Gentiles. to the Gentiles yes and who are the Gentiles people who aren't Jews, people who aren't Jews. that's correct all all people other than Jews so here's the verse 26 17 delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. And the NLT says, and I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. And yes, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. So, don't you, I just, you know, I kind of love the way God operates. Um, here's, here's Saul or Paul, and he has been, he is super educated, right? I mean, he is set under the very best of teachers of the law. And you would think, here's the guy that's probably the most qualified to make the case for Christ for the Jews, right? Now, so I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. <laughs> and here's Peter. And who was Peter? He was a fisherman. Un uneducated, right? He he was just a common laborer, and and what happens? God uses him to minister to the Jews. It it astounds you at times. The logic, sometimes, right? 
I mean, when you stop to think about it, but that that shows you just how God operates because it proves that it's it's not about the person. It's about the spirit inside of the person and the Holy Spirit working through them that brings the reward and brings the harvest. You see, I, I would have, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like David and uh, as, as Pastor Dan was teaching on Sunday, all of us would have, we wouldn't have chose David. I mean, but we'd have been out there picking out the next Saul. I mean, not some scrawny little kid. Here's Saul. He's head and shoulders. He's the man. You see, our, our judgment is clouded by the things that we see sometimes, and we're not looking through our spiritual eyes the way that God is seeing things, and God's picking out the people to operate in these positions and places to do his work and to fulfill his plan and purpose. So all the people uh, are that are not Jews are Gentiles. And it says in verse 17, delivering thee from uh, the people, from the Jewish people, this implied that he would be persecuted by them and that the Lord Jesus uh would rescue him from them. And we know this is true because even when Paul went on his missionary trips and he would always try to go to synagogues, uh, who was it that persecuted him? And who was it would try to run him out of town? It was always the riled up Jews that lived in those towns that got fired up and that would chase him out of town. And it says that from the Gentiles, this also implied that he would be persecuted and opposed by them. Uh, Paul, Paul really couldn't win. He, uh, he wasn't liked by the Jews and he wasn't liked by a lot of the Gentiles. Guess what? That's part of being in the ministry. If you're really preaching and you're really teaching the real word of God, some people aren't going to like it. They're just not going to like it. And uh, it says... He was persecuted and opposed by them, and as a prospect, which he was verified by the whole course of his ministry, yet in all he experienced, according to the promise, the support and the protection of the Lord Jesus was always with him. This was expressed in a summary manner in Luke chapter 9, verse 16, and it says, Unto him... Uh, now I send thee, Acts chapter twenty two twenty one, as the opposition of the Jews arose mainly from the fact that he had gone among the Gentiles. And it was important to bring this part of his commission into full view before Agrippa and to show that the same Savior who had miraculously converted him had commanded him to go and preach to them. So Paul's making his case uh, even though this really has no bearing on what's going to happen to him, he is just simply trying to make his case before Agrippa and Festus that the same God, you know, he, he, he says, you know, remember, he's, he's, he's asking King Agrippa, you, you know about the prophets, Agrippa, right? You, you, you know about the law. Here's my case. It's the same God who, who is for the Jews it's also for the Gentiles. It's the same God. He loves them and he loves the Gentiles and he's made a way for all to come to him. He's made a way. And he's making this case for Agrippa and how important it is for Agrippa to, to really understand how Saul has arrived or Paul has arrived at this point in time in his ministry. So what are the three things that Paul specifically uh, sent to do in his ministry to the Gentiles? Open their eyes to the things of darkness to light. Open, open their eyes. Turn, turn them from Satan into God. Uh, tur turn them from darkness to light and turn them from Satan to God. 
Why, why would he say from Satan to God? So what were most of the Gentiles involved in at that time? Yeah, very, very much. Uh, they were very much involved in idol worship. Uh, remember, uh, Paul gets thrown out of town because he, he uh, disrupts the commerce of an idol producer. Uh, he's taken another person's livelihood away who is speaking by divination or by demonic influence and casts the demon out of her, causes her to shut up, right? So what we're talking about is a very, a very active group of people in the Gentiles who at that time, they were very much into Greek and, and uh, Roman type of mythology. Uh, they were... They were, they were very much into uh, following all different kinds of idols. Remember, uh, as Paul walks through, remember he walks through uh, on Mars Hill and he says, here it is, it's to, to the tomb of an unknown God. Why? Because they had thousands of them. They had thousands of gods. And they couldn't figure out which one which one broke the famine for him? <laughs> so he says, I'm here to open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light, and turn them from Satan to God. We look at uh, 26, 18, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God. And now they may receive forgiveness of their sins and an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. The NLT says to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. He is saying these people are had the same opportunity as all of the original converts on the day of Pentecost. And all of those that were uh, Jewish believers that believed in Christ, these people, the Gentiles, have that same opportunity to believe in Christ and have salvation. And it's an opportunity that when you find salvation or salvation comes to you that you are brought into the light. In other words, you suddenly have the light ignited inside of you, which is the hope of Christ. And we are to be the light. The Bible tells us that. Jesus told us that. We're to be salt and we're to be light. We're to have that light shining in us. And he's saying these people are being brought into that light. For us to recognize them and to get them away from Satan because they have they've sought forgiveness. So to open their eyes, to be in, uh, the instrument of informing their understanding in the things of God, to turn them from darkness to light, from heathenism and superstition to the knowledge and the worship of of the true God, from the power of Satan unto God, uh, from the authority and the domination of Satan, for as the kingdom of darkness is his kingdom, as those who live in this darkness are under his dominion, and he has authority and right over them. The blessed gospel of Christ is that the means of bringing the soul from the state of spiritual darkness and wretchedness to the light and liberty of the children of God. And thus, they are brought from under the power and authority of Satan 
to be under the power and the authority of God and they may receive forgiveness of their sins that all their sins may be pardoned and their souls sanctified for nothing less is implied in the phrase it signifies the taking away really of or the removal of their sins and it says an inheritance they have an inheritance by remission of sins the removal of the guilt and the pollution of sin they become children of god and if children then heirs for the children of the heavenly family shall alone possess the heavenly estate and as the inheritance is said to be among them that are sanctified this is the father's proof uh, not only a forgiveness of sins but also the purification of heart but faith that is in me by believing on christ jesus as dying for those offenses Linda Ryder wrote, If God can take a murderer like Saul and make him a great minister for God, he can take a sinner and use them for God's service. And uh, Ernie writes, A lot of people don't believe that God can do anything like that, but even murderers have souls. And, you know, he, he's basically he's calling them, if you look at this, he's calling them uh, children or sons of God, Right? And we had this discussion uh, right before class tonight about is every single person, is throwing this out there for you, is every single person that's alive, are they children of God? Well, and I think John 1 says that God gives them power to become yes. the children of God. So, I think it was uh, it was actually based off of another discussion that we got there. But here's the point: every single human person is God's creation, mm -hmm. but only those who believe and have become the sons of God are His children. You see, if you don't accept Him as your Father then you're fatherless, and there's a word for that. Amen. Okay, so what, in 173, what did Paul state about the things he said? Verse 22. I choose nothing except what the prophets and Moses said would happen. Yeah, that they are only what M Moses and the prophets said should come. Uh, having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing both to small and great saying none other things than those which the prophets and moses did say should come in other words paul saying you know i never i'm not teaching anything that the moses and the prophets didn't prophesy that would come to pass why am i being persecuted here what part of this, how come you guys, you, 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 you fall in line and you jump all over the law and you jump all over the things of the prophets and Moses, especially Moses, but when I'm teaching really what Moses was doing and what he said would come to pass, how come now you have a problem? You don't fully believe what God said he was going to do, do you? That's what he's saying. Because that's what I'm teaching. And, and Paul's really saying this, why? Why is he making this point about Moses and the prophets? Because not everybody believes Moses and the prophets. 
Well, that's true, but there's a specific reason that Paul's making this particular point right now. But kind of throwing back into the into the Jewish people's faith, that like you said, hey, I'm teaching what you believe. I, you know, I, I, I'm saying the exact thing that you believe. Your problem is with me coming to the conclusion that that Jesus is the one that has fulfilled it. Right. So, so who who's in attendance again? Who's, he, who's Paul speaking to? Fancy people. Yeah. King Agrippa. King Agrippa. And King Agrippa has what kind of background? King Agrippa has a Jewish background, right? He knows about the prophets, and he knows about Moses, and he knows about the law. He knows, he's a, he knows all the customs. He knows all about all this stuff. So Paul's now found the target audience that he wants to be at so that he can make his case the case for Christ to King Agrippa. He's got him. I mean, honestly, Paul has done a, a magnificent job of lawyering his way to make the point of the final strike in a debate mode here. He's got him zeroed in and he's got a big bullseye on him going, look, you, you've opened yourself up and now I'm just going to drop the bomb on you. Here it comes. You you believe, King, right? You believe in the in the law. You believe in the prophets. And you know about Moses and his law. Well, guess what? All of those stories were all talking about Christ. All of those were pointing towards him. What a testimony Paul's giving to bring or try to win King Agrippa to the Lord. Paul begins uh, bringing this evidence to the point that the faith he represents is continue, uh, continuity, uh, a continuance basically with the Old Testament religion tolerated once again by, by the Romans. Again, he had to make that point not only to Agrippa, but he had to make that to Festus. Hey, what I'm teaching is a continuance, basically, of the law of the prophets and of Moses. Because, remember, the Romans had accepted the Jewish religion, and they accepted it and allowed it to take place. They blessed it or allowed it to operate without interference, for the most part. And so Paul's, Paul's making his case to them that, look, I... You know, that one of the accusations against me is I'm, I'm in some funky new uh, far-out religion. It's not new. It's the same religion. It's a continuance of the same thing you've already sanctified. It says, I continue to this day. It says that Paul continued uh, till then alive, notwithstanding all of the, of the fraud and all the force of his enemies is to acknowledge by him to be from God from whence he in fears towards his justification that what he had done was but a uh, in becoming a, a gratitude or bringing gratitude towards God that had maintained him in a life unto this very day witnessing both to small and great witnessing to all sorts princes or people implying that the truths of the gospel and the things of God uh, concerned Agrippa as well as the meanest of his auditors. And indeed, with God there is no respect of persons, and that we are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3, 28. The prophets and Moses... Um, Moses was himself also a prophet, but he is here made especially mentioned of because of his excellency above the other prophets, unto whom God spoke face to face, as also because he was the lawgiver to the Jews, and to whom upon all occasions 
they pretended to yield their obedience. And that was the case, remember, even with Jesus. They were always trying uh, to accuse Jesus of really being against what Moses had spoke. So, he says that they are only what Moses, he says, I'm only teaching what Moses and the prophet said would come. So what are the, what are the things that, the, uh, what are these things that Moses and the prophet said declared? In verse 23. Yes, that Christ should suffer, and he should be the first to rise from the dead, and he should show light to the people. And so in 23, that it reads that Christ should suffer, that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and, and to the Gentiles. Okay? And... That Christ should suffer, that is, that Christ or the Messiah should suffer this, though fully revealed in the prophets, the prejudices of the Jews would not permit them to receive. Uh, they expected their Messiah to be a glorious prince. I mean, remember? Remember what they said? Could any good thing come out of Nazareth? I mean, why? Because as, 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 as good as all the pictures that we have painted in our renditions of what we think Christ looks like, uh, this great-looking man, Scripture tells us that he wasn't anything great to look upon. I mean, that's what the scriptures tell us. Because if he, if he came in and he looked all this glorious, he'd be what? He'd be like another Saul. You'd choose him because of the way he looks and not because of the spirit that was upon him and the way that he operated. And see, that's what, that's what he was trying to get across there. For the people, they they were looking for something that looked entirely different. They wanted somebody. I mean, honestly, even even on on uh, on the day before or the Sunday before uh, Passover, as he comes down that hill, and they're shouting Hosanna on Palm Sunday. They're they're expecting. You know, they're expecting this guy, if he's the real guy, he's the real one, he's going to overthrow this, uh, this occupation from the Romans, and we're going to get our country back. We're going we're gonna to be back in charge. You know, that's what they were looking for. They weren't looking for somebody that would overthrow the sin in their life. They were looking for somebody that would overthrow the occupation of a foreign government in their land. You see... Christ didn't meet up with their mental expectation of who they thought he would be. And that's why they rejected him. That's why they couldn't accept him. Because he didn't do what they wanted him to do. He didn't fulfill what they expected. They expected the Messiah to be a glorious secular type prince and to reconcile the the 53rd, uh, out of 53rd uh, 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 chapter of Isaiah with their system, and they formed this childish notion, really, of two different messiahs. They, they formed this notion that there would be a messiah ben David, one that would be this kingly type of messiah, and then they uh, came up with this messiah Ben Ephraim, who should suffer, 
and be put to death. A distinction which we can't find anywhere else in the scriptures, but this is their thought process of what they were expecting. They thought there'd be these two different versions of a Messiah. And it says, as the apostles say, he preached none other things than those which Moses and the prophets said should come. Therefore, he understood that both Moses and the prophets spoke of the resurrection of the dead as well as the passion and the resurrection of Christ. And if this be so, the favorite system of the learned bishop cannot be true that the doctrine of immortality of the soul was unknown to the ancient Jew. That he should be the first, that he should rise from the dead, that is, that he should be the first who should rise from the dead so as to die no more. You know, we know, honestly, we know he's not the first to rise from the dead because he rose Lazarus, right? We're talking about a different resurrection. We're talking about a resurrection where you die no more. And we know that resurrection, even though Lazarus was resurrected, we know he died again at some point in time. And Mary and Martha got to experience that most likely again for the second time. And that is that he should be the first who should rise from the dead so as to die no more and to give his own person the proof of his resurrection uh, of the human body no more to return under the empire of death. In no other sense can Jesus be said to be the first that rose again from the dead. For we know that uh, Elisha raised the son of the Shumanite, a dead man uh, put into the same uh, sceptre of, of the prophet Elisha was restored to life. Remember, they threw him in there and the dead bones of Elisha brought him back to life. I don't, that probably had to be quite the event for the uh, funeral service that day. They throw a body in there and he comes back out. Uh, restored to life as soon as he touched the prophet's bones. Christ himself would have raised the, widow, uh, the widow's son, uh, Nain, and he had also raised Lazarus and several others. All these died again. But the human nature of our Lord was raised from the dead and can die no more. Thus he was the first who rose again from the dead and to return no more to the empire of death. Because he said, he said his words are, as he said, I go in, I went in and I said, I, I demand the keys of hell and of death. And he says, the, where's your sting? The sting's gone because I'm not dying anymore. I died, but I rose again, and I'm not dying anymore. I'm alive forevermore, says the Lord. Forevermore. He's living, and he's living inside of us forevermore. That's the good news. Amen? Amen. So Paul's really got him into this. Uh, he's got them all into this great place of, of right where he wants them about who Christ is and he's the fulfillment of the prophets he's the fulfillment of Moses and he he is showing that his education is paying off now and his story his witness remember he could have just said no I've already appealed and I don't want to talk to you I'm just going to sit in my cell but he had an opportunity and he's using it He's using his opportunity for the kingdom. And I pray that each one of us use the opportunities that are set before us to advance the kingdom and to do something, to witness to whoever we can and advance the kingdom while there's still time, while there's still somebody to listen. And Father, we thank you tonight, God, for all that you do. We thank you for your word, uh, God. We thank you for your son, God, that overcame death. God, that has given us life. 
uh, God, and life more abundantly, God, that that same resurrection power, God, uh, that he experienced, we have experienced because, God, your word declares to us that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And hallelujah, by your power and your resurrected power in us, God, we have been transformed from death into life in you. And God, we thank you for that work of sanctification. We thank you, God, for that work of consecration into our lives and all that you have done for us. Now go with us, be with us, keep us safe in everything we say and do. And we give you all honor and all glory tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.